And we have completed what 14 or 15 years of continuous CME. And uh, in the absence of Dr. Chauhan, who has to attend uh, to his daughter's uh, placement, I have to take over. And today we are going to have uh, uh, from Fortis Escorts, uh, the topic would be practical management of common GI disorders. And Dr. Acharya and Dr. Puri is going to take over. Before that, uh, we would like to have the moderator, uh, Dr. Amal Kalra with us, who is going to start the uh, introduction. Welcome, friends, to the ACME. management of GI disorders in our practice. So it's my duty to introduce two of the legends. One, Dr. Subrat Kumar Acharya. I am meeting him first time. He is senior to us. He has been with AIMS. He has been with AIMS as a head of gastroenterology and hepatology. And uh, I won't uh, take more time in introducing and uh, giving so many accolades. Suffice it to say, his Badam Shri and his interests are in acute and chronic liver failure, primary liver cancer, viral hepatitis, and uh, all areas of gastroenterology and liver disease, including transplant of uh, liver. So I'm cutting short his. Uh, uh, very valued um, introduction. He has done so much in the field of gastroenterology. Same way, I am cutting short Dr. Brigadier Pankaj Puri's uh, introduction also. He is uh, very close to me because he has worked with one of my mentor, Dr. Kartar Singh at PGI. He has been uh, alumni of uh, AFMC Pune. His main interest is management of chronic liver disease, liver failure, management of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and AFLD, liver transplant, inflammatory bowel disease, and therapeutic endoscopy and uh, ERCP. So, friends, uh, my my part is over to introduce the uh, main legends, Dr. Puri will take care and he will introduce all his team members because I am new to them and it's over to Dr. Puri to take us to very interactive. My humble suggestion is that we will keep the talk uh, short and just concise. Take home message will be more important and most of uh, uh, interactions will be remembered us, remembered by us and uh, I assure my speakers yeah, they will love the interaction in the end. We have so many yaks, yaks ka matlab to samajhte honge, the one who asked 100 questions from the minister. So we have not one, a few, uh, three, four at least I remember. Dr. Tulsi is one of them. <laughs> Sir, Dr. Puri. Acharya needs no introduction. He's been the teacher of teachers and he continues to guide a lot of people across all generations.
Volume, Speaker, volume. Volume, ठीक. Yes, no, no. Not audible, sir. आर्मी वालों की आवाज है थोड़ा सा और इंक्रीज कर दो थोड़ा सा थोड़ा चलने नहीं लग सारे ही बंद Let me also introduce two other team members here. That's Dr. Surakshit, who's sitting in the middle. He's a young dynamic person who did his training in Gangaram Hospital. And he's a master in all endoscopic procedures and especially very good at endoscopic biopsy. And he's one of our leading team members in therapeutic endoscopies and he's doing a lot of third space endoscopies including point. And here we have Dr. Piyush. He's an alumni of Foreign Institute of Medical Sciences. And he has done advanced fellowship in inflammatory bowel disease. Again, they're all across all specialties. They're doing lots of therapeutic endoscopies. And the last team member, which was not here, was on leave right now is uh, Dr. Abhinav, who's gone on leave for a couple of days. He's also an integral part of the team. And we have two young team members sitting here across, Dr. Amit and Dr. Anus. With that, I will start today's talk. Thank you, Dr. Kamra and Dr. Tulsi, for the kind introductions. It's a pleasure to come to this forum. Yeah. These are some of the topics which we will be covering. Uh, GRD, dysplasia, constipation, IDD. And we'll try and keep it short and have an interactive session. And there'll be questions in between, but which I'll request people to be brief in their interaction so we can finish in time. We'll start with GRD. Here's a 47-year-old male who's come with classical symptoms of reflux. And he keeps taking PPI and he's very worried. He's concerned about all these things he's been reading about the side effects of long-term PPIs. The first thing is how do we address these concerns of long-term PPIs? What investigation should we do? Who should undergo endoscope? Who should undergo PH medication? And some of these things we'll discuss as we go along. Mm -hmm. While proton pump inhibitors have excellent safety mm -hmm. profiles, they're having concerns about over prescribing concerns about fractures, they have concerns about kidney disease, they have concerns on many things like pneumonias and chest infections and small intestinal bacterial removal. So all these concerns have been raised by the media. The thing is nobody has looked at what's the quality of the data, what's the method of collection of the data and what's the magnitude of the effect of these adverse events. So if you look at this little summary of all the side effects, we find that the quality of evidence in the red box is either very low or low. So as clinicians, how do we modify our practice, keeping the light is abundant, but yet conflicting data and the strong media push to reduce PPI usage? While this data is weak, we cannot ignore it, and we must prescribe proton pump inhibitors wisely. We must use the lowest possible dose. Don't keep using twice a day proton pump inhibitors. Especially don't use proton pump inhibitors with down per 30 mg twice a day, which is unreasonable. We must be vigilant about the long-term use of PPIs and try and taper them off if required. 
and we can consider all demand treatment in people with mild disease. And with this, I will get on to the. So let. So will you just take over? So in GRD, there are typical symptoms and atypical symptoms. Typical symptoms are heartburn and regurgitation. These are the patients who respond well to a trial of PPI. Whenever there is atypical symptoms, that is persistent cough, chest pain, what I know, phagia, burps, hiccups, these are the patients which who need a endoscopy before proceeding further. So before giving a trial of PPI, these patients with atypical symptoms of GERD, they should undergo endoscopy. So how do we manage GERD? Why do we do endoscopy? So first is to rule out any other pathology other than GERD, if there is any obstruction, any strictures, or if there is a long-standing regurgitation, there may be an underlying Barrett's disease, and even eosinophilic esophagitis, which is much more com which is, uh, common and can mimic symptoms of GERD. So, to confirm the diagnosis of GRT, we need a pH monitoring. pH monitoring will tell three things. We have to differentiate between three things. That is, one is functional dyspepsia, true GRD, and hypersensitive esophagus. Hypersensitive esophagus, these are the people who have a normal reflux, but they are very much sensitive to even normal amounts of acid reflux. Then there is functional dyspepsia, where there is no reflux at all, but still patient has symptoms. And the third one is the true reflux, GRD. These are the patients who may respond to anti-reflux uh, measures. So these, to differentiate between these, we need a pH monitoring. At the same time, we need to do even a manometry to see if there is any motility disorders of the esophagus. So this is a simple uh, approach to GRD. Who have typical symptoms, treat them with PPI. If there is response, try to de-escalate and taper off and stop PPIs. If we cannot uh, taper these medicines or if there are atypical symptoms, then investigate. If there is Barrett's uh, esophagus or LA grade C and D esophagitis, that is confirmatory that patient has true reflux and we can go ahead with the treatment of uh, GRD with anti-reflux measures. If there is LA grade A esophagitis, these need further testing to see if there is any, uh, there is true GRD or not and based on that we treat accordingly. So mainstay of treatment is lifestyle changes that is very important, weight loss, bed and elevation at night, alcohol and smoking and the foods that trigger a reflux, these should be avoided and we have good PPIs, PPI are the best. And then apart from that, we have endoscopic minimally invasive procedures. And the take-home message is all patients may need, will need endoscopy. And PPI are safe. PPI can be prescribed for long term. However, we can try and de-escalate PPIs. If they are not responding, then they need further testing. And these who are the patients who require pH metry, that is, to confirm the association between acid reflux and symptoms before any endoscopic or surgical procedure, before proceeding with a fund application or endoscopic anti-reflux measures, we need to do a pH measure. So, simple endoscopic procedure is ARMA, that is anti-reflux mucosal ablation. Uh, here we can see this was recently done in our patient. So, we burn around in a butterfly fashion, leaving around 2 centimeters. Uh, we burn the entire circumference at the G junction. So, this is a, not a full thickness burn, this is just a superficial burn where the mucosa and submucosa is burned. So, when it heals, this causes some fibrosis, and if there is a lax esophagus, this tightens and this prevents the reflux. This is a very simple procedure which hardly takes 20 to 30 minutes. And we need to choose patients selectively. If there is a sliding height as hernia of more than 2-3 cm, these are the patients who may require a surgery rather than doing endoscopy. If the, there is no height as hernia, if there is just a lax G junction and there is true reflux on pH testing, 
this is an excellent thing which can give excellent results. And apart from that, most of these GRD patients have a functional component also that also needs to be taken care of. Thank you, thank you Dr. Sorakshan. So, we should advise lifetime measures, lowest dose of EPI, and we have endoscopic therapy and surgery are options in refractory symptoms of patients who want to avoid not Let's just pick up next a case of GRD. And I'll pick up one case and have the audience uh, comment on what they think would be like. This is a 20 year old patient who's come with black stools and weakness. His uh, blood pressure is 100 by 70 and he has postural hypotension, some tachycardia, anemic. He's got no stigmata of chronic liver disease, but the spleen is palpable 2 centimeters. There's no ascites for encephalopathy. What do you think is the likely cause and what should we do next after basic resuscitation? So, any comments from the audience? So what do you think is the cause? The first, how do we approach? Obviously, it's a J bleed. It's a bleed. You see, the number two thing was bleed is possible in a patient with J bleed. And you see, very careful, carefully, Dr. Pankaj didn't give you a history of any previous history of heartburn, any history of NSAID intake, any history of hunger pain, any history of pain subsiding after taking food, but the patient presented with a bleed and a black spot, indicating it is a bleed above the ligament of bridge, that is above the duodenal junctions. Now he doesn't give any history of any type of acid peptic disease. 10% of patients with acid peptic disease can be silent and can present with malina as the first presentation. However, a thumbs rule is if you have palpated a screen, chances of having portal hypertension is very high on the card. Second thing is Usually patients with chronic liver disease following a bleed have associated liver dysfunction feature which we call as decompensation in the form of ascites or encephalopathy or edema or jaws. But it depends upon the liver reserve and the previous history. There are other causes of portal hypertension as well like non serotic portal fibrosis, extrapathic portal venous obstruction. Is a 20 years old man? And if you see non serotic causes of portal hypertension are more frequent in younger people, whereas the median age of cirrhosis around 6, 7, about 50 to 55, all over the world, depending upon the etiology. So if you say that, you have to keep this in mind that while duodenal ulcer and acid peptic disease is possible, drug induced erosive mucosal disease is unlikely because there is no history. The portal hypertension is in the car and non serotic causes are more likely. I will analyze like this. Thank you, sir. And Dr. Piyush, will you just tell us a few things about GRP? Thank you, Dr. Acharya. I think Dr. Acharya has wonderfully summarized the history. So, this because of the palpable screen, portal hypertension is thing that is to be considered in this case. So, first we have to know what is hematomesis, malina, and hematochemia. Patient presenting with the upper GI bleed, that is blood and vomitus, and malina, that is black, tari, liquidy stool, which is foul smell, suggests that patient uh, can have a bleed which is above the ligament of TDs. So the causes could be uh, varicel or fun uh, esophageal with or fundal, or it could be because of ulcer related bleed. Secondly, hematochesia is fresh PR bleed. It is usually uh, a bleeding source below the ligament of teres, but a massive upper GI bleed can present as hematochesia. So, like in our case, in our patient, patient could very well be having an upper GI source. So, how do we proceed? We do after the usual resuscitation and stabilization, after starting uh, the vasopressor drugs, we go ahead and do an upper GI endoscopy. We look for the scope, uh, for the source of bleed. If we don't find anything in a patient with malina, we go ahead and do a colonoscopy. Still, we don't find any source of bleed. We have other treatment, other investigative modalities that we offer, like enteroscopy and a capsule endoscopy to look for the source of bleed. If still 
the source is not identified, we have nuclear scintigraphy, CT angio, and conventional angiography to look for the source of bleed. Now, this patient could be very well having a variceal bleed or a non variceal bleed. So, in case the patient has a non variceal bleed, as many of you uh, pointed out, could be an ulcer as 10% of the patient can have uh, even with this SC. So, in a case that there is an ulcer of the visible vessel, we can use therapeutic modalities like uh, ADR injection and a heater probe and we can also apply hemoclips endoscopically to stop the bleed. If in case the patient has esophageal varices, we can go ahead and do banding, esophageal banding to stop the bleed or we can also do endoscopic sclerotherapy. Now a uh, few patients with portal hypertension do present with uh, fundal varices. Fundal varices bleed is very notorious and is difficult to manage. So these patients if have large fundal globular virus can be tackled with glue injection, cyanoacrylated glue injection or endoscopic EUS guided coiling, which is relatively safer modality and a good uh, therapeutic intervention to do in such cases. If the bleed is uncontrollable or we find a specific subset of patients who would require other uh, re uh, modality, so we have, we in our center also have tips which can help in reducing the portal hypertension and control the bleed. Thank you, thank you Dr. Fiyush. You know, dysphagia is also a very troublesome symptom and sometimes we tend to fall with dysphagia, we worry about obstruction. Many times these are also neurological causes of dysphagia. And then uh, we have Dr. Uh, okay, so any questions on the... What is glue stand, sir? What is glue stand? The glue that we use in acute bleed is cyanoacrylate glue. It's a beta 4 uh, butyl Same thing compound. Same thing is there very quick. Uh, it's a compound where it is, when it, it gets in contact with the ionized particles, within, like say RBC or uh, basically any water uh, containing fluid, it immediately poly polymerizes and forms a cast. So if there is a spurter, if there is a bleeding spurter, so we inject glue and immediately the glue will solidify within the vessel. Sir, so so yes, I just explain it. Cyanoacrylate is actually monomer chemical. When it compounds with hydrogen water, hydrogen oxygen, it will become a polymer. Polymer is much more thick and molecular. Fundal varices are a bunch of grapes like dilated base in the fundus. Up to the top. We have question up to the top. Okay, they are okay, dependent okay. person and bleed massive. It is very difficult to bind them. It is very difficult to inject them. And they intercommunicate with them. So what we do, we in, in, inject the cyanoacrylate. And when it contacts with common blood, it immediately polymerizes. And blocks the whole grapes. And even if you remove it by later on some people die and remove it, you can see a cast, right? And the cast it actually infiltrates into the veins. So many times when it's polymerizes, it stops the leaking site and stops the bleed. But we will always recheck later on. When you recheck later on and endoscopically when you see this area, you can actually with a catheter tip you can feel it, palpate it. There will be some areas hard, some areas may be soft. Depending upon the size of some area, we may inject subsequently to prevent rebleed. Because remember, once there is a variceal index bleed, the recurrence of bleed is very frequent. That's why this approach in such cases is necessary. And Dr. Pius showed you tips. If they recur repeatedly, we usually we will do a dip because each bleed can fit. So we provide from the very beginning not only assessment, stop the taking variceal bleed to save his life, do the secondary prophylaxis and see that you will not be bleed, try to give him a permanent solution so that his quality of life is improved and he doesn't have recurrent hospitalization and find out his underlying cause and treat the cause of portal hypertension. We give a holy spirit. So we also have, often what we do is we inject, before injecting we also put coils so that the blue cast becomes stronger. May I request that we finish off everything in 20 yes. minutes and have a long yes. question yes. answer center. Yeah. Yeah. So I think otherwise we will 
So dyspasia is a very common symptom we come across. So I will tell you a simple approach for dyspasia. So what are the things we ask? Whether dyspasia is predominantly for solids or liquids, duration, age of presentation, whether there is any history of smoking, tobacco chewing, any weight loss or associated chest pain. So if the dyspasia is predominantly for solids, that means there is a structural abnormality. So we do an endoscopy, we can see some structural abnormality, it may be a stricture, it may be a growth, depending on the duration. If it's a long standing, then malignancy is unlikely. So if it's a progressive, it may be a peptic ulcer disease which is causing a stricture and it may be a esophagitis. Then if it's intermittent, intermittent dyspepsia is seen in eosinophilic esophagitis. Typically a patient having a meal, usually a non-veg chicken getting stuck intermittently. That's a typical symptom. And if there is an web sorting, if there is a recent onset dyspepsia, we should think of malignancy. If there is any associated weight loss or history of smoking, alcohol or tobacco chewing. Then if the patient has predominantly dyspepsia for liquids or solids plus liquids, that suggests it's a motility disorder of the esophagus, which is very common. So we do an endoscopy, most of the times patient complains of dyspepsia, but endoscopy is normal. And most of the times these patients can be missed. So it is very important, we have a strong suspicion and if there is a dyspepsia and normal endoscopy, all these patients should undergo esophageal manometry to test for any esophageal motility disorder. So there are various types of esophageal motility disorders. It, the most common one we come across is the achalasia. Achalasia, there are different types, type 1, 2, 3. Based on that, uh, we have the different treatment modalities for uh, achalasia. So best one is the poem. There are very, uh, uh, there are so many studies which tell the efficacy of poem and lap hellers. So only disadvantage of poem is the amount of reflux. Fortunately, this reflux we need to compromise between the treatment and the adverse effect. The reflux is around 10 to 20 percent. Unfortunately, these patients do well long term. They do not require PPI. So there are modifications in poem per oral endoscopic myotomy where the amount of reflux can be reduced. A long term efficacy of poem for 5 years down the line and 10 years down the line for 5 years it is almost more than 90 percent and for 10 years more than 85 percent which is much better than lap handlers. And if there are other types of esophageal motility disorders like distal esophageal spasm, hypercontractile esophagus. These, these are the patients who present with chest pain predominantly and also occasional dysphagia. Even then, even in them, a, a peroral endoscopic myotomy. Myotomy is we selectively cut the uh, uh, esophageal muscle, circular muscles so that the contraction vigor decreases and there will be the relief in dysphagia and also the chest pain. So even for other motility disorders, POEM is equally effective. Thank you, thank you Dr. Smaksha. So carry on lesson is, person is having dysphagia which is intermittent and often to fluids, think in terms of motility disorder. We are having dysphagia and he's having a normal endoscopy, think of a case. Now next is constipation. You know, there was a statement by a guy called Josh Billings. He said a good set of brains means more to a man. Good set of bowels means more to a man than any set of brains. Dr. Piyush, will you take over this case? So uh, we have a case here. 30 year old gentleman, CA by occupation, presented with constipation for 5 years. One Stool frequency once in 3 to 4 days. Patient has got Bristol type 1. Two stools which are hard and pellet like, showing symptoms of uh, strong urge, incomplete evacuation, and straining while defecation. Important thing to note here is patient has got no alarm symptoms and is already on laxatives and there is partial response. So, the important thing to note here is what is dysenergic defecation? I am sure the majority of you must be seeing constipation day in and day out. So, patients who do not respond to the conventional measures like laxatives and desubgurth should be looked for this problem. 
mainly symptoms like incomplete evacuation, straining, excessive uh, defecogram, which uh, demonstrates the anatomy, the anorectal angle, and the uh, anatomy during the defecation. So this is the anorectal manometry of the patient, which was done. So this figure typically shows, on the top it is showing the pressures in the rectum and the bottom column is the pressures in the inner canal. So the left half of it is showing the, uh, the normal pressure in the rectum and increased pressure in the inner canal. When the patient is asked to strain, you can see that the rectal pressure is increasing but paradoxically the inner pressure is also increasing. Ideally the inner canal should have relaxed. So this is a kind of dysenergia and is type 1. The main treatment modality that will help this patient and response rate is as high as 70% is biofeedback therapy. In biofeedback therapy, the patient is trained to coordinate the bowel movements, how to increase the pelvic pressure using the pelvic muscles and how and this patient is also taught how to relax the anal sphincters. Thank you, Dr. Kirish. Don't put the thing down because I want to cover the next one as well. So, uh, this is another case. Uh, a 28-year-old 20 year lady presenting with short history of blood in stool mixed with uh, increased stool frequency and blood in stool which is both mixed and separate. Patient has got fever, how would he approach? If you look at this history, this is a 10-day history of diarrhea and blood. So on the outlook, it appears to be acute infectious colitis which could be very well because of any bacterial, viral or parasitic infection which is usually the case in 80 to 85 percent of cases. So, majority of the patient with antibiotics, which are usually given, will respond. But there is a specific subset of patients which will not respond to this antibiotic therapy. This is where you have to look for other causes, like inflammatory bowel disease, ischemic colitis, which can present with a short history because of acute exacerbation. So what is inflammatory bowel disease? We'll have a short discussion on this. There are two types of inflammatory bowel disease. Our patient had rectal bleed with increased stool frequency. So the patient could very well be having ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis is a disease which starts from the inner canal and it uh, goes up in the colon and is usually confined to the large intestine. In this autoimmune condition you see lots of ulcers which are confined, superficial ulcers which are confined to the mucosa. The disease do not complicate with fistula, uh, fistulas like the counterpart Crohn's. In Crohn's also we see 30% of the patient with colonic involvement can present like this, can present with bleed. So these patients do have deep ulcers and transmural inflammation unlike the ulcerative colitis and can have complications of strictures and fistulas. So how to approach this case? The usual and the most important investigation that it is to be done in patients who do not respond to the conventional ther therapy is colonoscopy. We go inside the lumen, we see, we document the ulcers and we take biopsies to document the chronicity. Chronicity will tell us in the biopsy, uh, uh, the crypt architectural distortion and basal plasma cytosis will tell us that no, this is not an acute event. Patient has been having some subtle inflammation which has got precipitated because of maybe an aberrant precipitation of immune response or an superimposed infection. Then we have other modalities like CT enterography which can tell us the mural inflammation, the increased uptake in the bowel. Then we have other modalities to, uh, to document the disease if it is predominantly small bowel involvement like a double balloon enteroscopy which can visualize almost the complete small bowel and a capsule endoscopy to see the ulcers and to uh, then we can direct our therapy. This is a pyramid which I'll briefly describe as we have to first uh, classify the patient as mild to moderate or moderate to severe disease. We start from down to up with ASAs, prednisolone and uh, biologics in patients who have mild disease. But if the patient presents with high risk features, is of young age, is having fistulizing disease or predominantly small bowel disease, we start from top up. Like we directly go ahead and start with biologicals and then we uh, monitor the patient for response and move accordingly. I think Dr. Pius will never finish because he's, that's his special interest. So we'll just go to the next one.
This is an approach to learn. So I'm just going to pick up one case and show you some sample cases out there. One approach. He has a 38-year-old male who's come with jaundice of 10 days. He's got fever with chills. Uh, there's no prodrome. He's hectic. Liver is palpable 3 centimeters. His bedroom is 4 and a half. It's my advice in design, but it's got a significant rise in alkaline phosphates. Obviously, he has no, he has no obvious itching or clay-colored stool, but he has some poly static pattern in design. And the only way to look at it really is the first step is to look at an ultrasound to see if the duct is dilated. If the ducts are dilated, we have to look at the granular. If the ducts are not dilated, we have to think in terms of an intrahepatic cholestasis. In our patient, the duct was dilated. There is a, a, a 20 millimeter stone in the pipe. He underwent ERCP, spyglass, and laser lithotripsy, and CBD clearance. Since we have a shortage of time, I'm just only going to give three carry home messages of a patient who's got polystatic jaundice with obstruction. The first is for difficult bilateral stones, there are many options. And we just don't send everybody to the center. Cholangioscopy and laser is one of the options. For small bilateral stones, we may miss them on ultrasound, we may miss them even on MRC. So endoscopic ultrasound should be the modality of choice. Endoscopic ultrasound also has advantage in picking up malignancy. Dr. Suraksha, will you just cover a few of these things? So, coming to laser lithotripsy, most of the times, ERCP, in simple ERCP, uh, we can remove most of the stones. So, but some rare situations, we need something more than ERCP. So, we need to do a cholangioscopy. Cholangioscopy is a simple scope, which is a five-friend scope, which is passed through our normal endoscope. This is a scope in scope. So, if there is a large stone, which is more than 15 mm, if there is an impacted stone, if there are multiple stones, if there is intrahepatic ductal stones. In these cases, we can go through the cholangioscopy and we can see the stones and we can break these stones with a laser. So this is a video. So you can see this is a laser probe and once in the laser probe, that's a large stone, but you can see the black color thing and now we are firing it. So in this way, we can fragment it, a large stone which is more than 20, 30 mm also, we can easily fragmented and clear the CBD. And coming to EUS, so EUS is a very important modality, especially if there is a distal common bulb that stone, so ERCP, the EUS is much better than MRCP. So EUS can pick up MRCP, uh, uh, even small stone which is 3 mm, even in a ball bladder, if a patient has pancreatitis, and ultrasound and MRCP may miss gallstones, but EUS can pick sludge, microliths, which is less than 3, and even in a patient with pancreatitis. So, most of the times we label it as idiopathic pancreatitis. Ultrasound is normal and gallbladder is normal on ultrasound. We evaluated for other causes of pancreatitis, but US is the one which answers whether it is really idiopathic. So, what we label idiopathic, most of the times EOS can yield, has a yield of almost 50 to 70 percent and it can detect microliths if there is any tumor or if there is an underlying chronic pancreatitis. So EOS is a very important modality. Here we can see the first image showing a small 3 mm calculus which is sitting at the distal CBD. And the second image shows an ampullary tumor. This can be missed in a CT and MR. But U.S. can pick these lesions and we can even sample these lesions. So we sort of wind up to more commoner things which we see routinely in our practice, fatty liver. Oh, it's so common and it's a whole debate by itself. But what I'll just show you is a small survey we did of doctors at our hospital. Mm. We had 40 people, fatty liver was there in 34. But look at significant fibrosis and cirrhosis. This is our cell. I think we need to look at our cell. The whole long list of choices between pills and surgery and lifestyle really goes for lifestyle. And we need to do quite however, management of obesity is the cornerstone and we need to look at if the patient can't manage, we have to look at surgery or we have to look for gastric And last thing we're going to cover is cirrhosis. 
So we have two patients here. So one is a patient who's picked up incidentally to have cirrhosis and ultrasound. The right side is a decompensated liver disease with ascites, medicinal bleed. And I think there's no better person than Dr. Acharya to tell us about this. And we're going to close the slides here, but I'm going to tell you only one little you know, memory of mine. The first time I saw Dr. Acharya was when he came and told me a story of his baker. And I wonder whether he would be happy to return, repeat that for the audience. No, no well, this is a story I used to tell to my students actually. Uh, because in liver disease, uh, um, if I remember when I started way back in the early 1970s, there was no treatment. And uh, at that time I was a student at AIMS and I read a book uh, called Viral Appetites. And it was written by a great man, his father of Dr. in the United States. His name is Harold Paul. Uh, the man who wrote constantly and so the man who finally identified spontaneous bacterial peritonitis in cirrhosis, which you are treating today. He is the man. He wrote, uh, well, my patients uh, come and call me, I am a great physician. They say, Dr. Khan, you are a great physician. Because when I see my patient with acute, this is in quotes, when I see my patients with acute hepatitis, I assure them, look, there is no treatment. Go back home. And Continue to do your liver function test. If it doesn't normalize, come back to me. Those who come back to me, I poke a needle into their liver like a baker pokes his needle into the cake to find out whether it has been done with or not. Cake for beer. When I find in the low biopsy there is chronic liver disease, chronic hepatitis, I see your okay. look. There is no key. Go back home. Have barium swallow and endoscopy had just come. And if you possibly get a endoscopy, you have swollen veins in your two part. Do come back. And they come back to me with the evidences of various esophageal viruses. I assure them, look, there is no treatment. Go back home. If you bleed, come back to us. Those who bleed will come back to us. We admit them, give them transfusion, and each bleed has an attrition rate of 30 percent. And those who survive, two thirds of them will be bleed within a year. And each time there is 30 percent attrition. And at the end of one to two years, those who survive, they come back to me and tell, well, Dr. Khan, you are a great physician. You say no. <laughs> Very good. Friends, at each day, I saw that we can interrupt. We can change. Starting from the step one to this large step and can prevent that. Each step has there. Each step has specific place. The step can be identified and the stage can be clearly defined. The functions of liver can be quantitated both in a various fashion. And accordingly, you may not even some early cirrhosis can be reversed today. I remember giving many talks that cirrhosis is reversal. Reversing. Right? That's a different lecture altogether with the pathogenesis of fibrosis, the changes of cytokine. How you are going to improve. And so the advancement in liver disease is so much. And therapy at this state is so much. There is tremendous. And that is the advancement of knowledge and science today to salvage life and provide them. That is the story I used to tell to my student, Pankaj probably remembered. And I remember this so vividly about 25 30 years back. When I was a student, I and now things have changed. We are doing transplants, we are even doing transplants regularly, every month six to eight transplants. Everything has changed over the past years. Even the bleeds we treat well, even the liver failures we can treat well, even the liver cancer can be treated. And I call for liver cancer detected early in a high risk liver patient is children. Because we know who are the high risk patients of liver cancer. You can screen them, follow them up, and if you have small liver cancer, we stage that. We can cure. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. Given a very, very vivid talk. Uh, frankly speaking, when I just uh, when I first saw uh, name of Dr. <coughs> SK Acharya, I was reminded of Kripacharya and Dronacharya. I thought somebody <laughs> like him, and uh, he is even he has proved uh, me right. I had a gut feeling that this uh, GI uh, 
Uh, conference will be a great success. CFE today will be very great. Success. Thanks to my microbiomes who guided me this gut feeling. So, uh, I have so many yaks, I, I told you. I'm just a yakshul. I'll start my very simple questions. I'm reminded of my days when I was doing my MD. I had dyspnea at uh, my thesis. And I, I was doing epidemiology just to see how common is post required webs and plumber syndrome in that area of Rotak uh, uh, camp. Anyway, sir. So, constipation, friends, is either hard stool or hardly any stool for us. That is constipation. Just giving my comments. Yes, anaphilic uh, esophagitis is something new. We never heard when we were students. And we were never we were knowing about helicobacter at that time. Yeah. And uh, even PPI were not born in early 80s when I was with my MD. Sir, uh, this uh, MR defecto, defecto gram or whatever is just like a eurofluometry, you can say it will equal to that. My only question is how to deal with asymptomatic gallstone. I am uh, presented with almost daily when I doing, I am doing my preventive health checkups. What is your take home? Can I answer that? Yeah. Yes. Well, you see why you are confused? Because of the epidemiolog epidemiological data arising from the West. If you see Western studies, right? Now there are there are various very famous studies called the Ripco study. I launched 20 years follow-up of Boston in a large number of executives. And they found over 20 years there was no sinister symptoms. And those who develop sinister symptoms, they provide early warning of biliary colic or biliary dyspepsia. Sir, malignancy of gallbladder in all this area is infrequent and very low in if you compare the Ganges belt in North India, this is the highest frequency or incidence as well as prevalence of gallbladder cancer in this area and 90% of the gallbladder malignancy are associated with cholesterol. I agree. We do not have a cohort follow-up of asymptomatic gallstone over 25 or 30 years from this country to say whether they have a higher risk of gallbladder cancer. But having said that, the association of gallstone with gallbladder malignancy is very high. Keep this in mind. Second, if you see the various series of acute pancreatitis in this space, in this country, the first episode of acute pancreatitis is 30% of them has gallstone and they do not have previous symptoms. So acute pancreatitis may be first presentation. Right. If you keep these two figures in mind, then when your approach will differ. If you see a 30 years young girl with a gallstone and asymptomatic 2 years, I will be worried because see his probability of life is 50 years and you are leaving the gallstone there for the rest. In contrast, I see 80 years man of asymptomatic gallstone, his probability of life is 5 to 10 years. There I will probably not into. So my asymptomatic gallstone approach in this country will be depend, it's a case to case, depending upon the age, keeping this epidemiological fact in mind. So all young patients, right, I will, I personally suggest that, despite lack of evidence in this country, to get them off, to all order them off. Second, last thing, sir, the mortality because of laparoscopic polycystectomy is 1 in 10,000. If you see the risk of mortality in walking in Delhi, it is more than 1. So I have given you answer. Sir, so my, uh, I am giving yes. mic to Dr. Tulsi. Just, just asking that four apps when we, when we were studying the more gallbladder stone, female, forty, fertile, fair, and all that. So they are a bit now. We are seeing uh, gallbladder stones in very early stage in our early twenties. Yes. So maybe some reasons, Dr. Tulsi, to take over. Yes, sir. So you said uh, gallstone asymptomatic. You would like to treat because of fear of. Sir, you have not, you have not mic. 
क्वेश्चन <laughs> सर So I like to ask Dr. Surakshit. So EUS has come a long way from a mere diagnostic tool to an advanced therapeutic modality, especially in the management of GI malignancy. What do you say? Definitely, definitely, sir. Uh, GI malignancy. Not, not only that. Other other interventions like uh, ciliated plexus interventions, drainage of pancreatic fluid. collections pancreatic care biliary access drainage of uh, drainage and gi bleeds pelvic abscesses eus guided anti tumor neoplasms eus guided biliary drainage is now an alternative when ercp fails we are even draining gallbladder through us absolutely we can even do a anastomosis between small intestine jejunum and the gastrointestinal can be done even in us so us is a excellent tool we can diagnose Sometimes we can even see depending on the type of cancer, and we can even treat the cancer. Even neuroendocrine tumors in the pancreas, we can do radio frequency ablation. Even in liver, we can do radio frequency ablation. We can do we can do liver biopsies, which are as safe as percutaneous biopsies. So these are EOS is an excellent tool. Come a long way, uh, Dr. Chaya sir. So diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. See, according to revised Atlanta classification. So at least two of the following: pain abdomen, which would be consistent with the acute pancreatitis features, and then uh, amylase, lipase, three times more than the uh, normal, and uh, uh, imaging, CT or MRI. What would you prefer, CT or MRI? Sir, normally in a classical case of acute pancreatitis, so patients with a pain abdomen with ileus being referred to the back. Right, with raised serum, amylase, and lipase is enough to give diagnosis. Wonderful, sir. Second, if you do CT immediately, right, ultrasound has a poor sensitivity. Remember, when there is the ileus, because gas prevents the sound wave, so its sensitivity is low, specificity is high. But CT imaging may not reflect in the initial first 24 to 48 hours Absolutely. any pancreatic change. Usually, CT imaging will come from third to fifth day. We prefer to do a CT in such patient to assess the CT severity index right. on fifth day if it is necessary. Second, acute pancreatitis mortality occurs because of two reasons: organ failure and infection. So, in the first week of pancreatitis, we focus whether he has organ failure, like renal failure, respiratory failure. cardiovascular failure like fall in hypotension because there are a huge amount of cytokine will be released so, so we will be focus to the organ failure so that would be probably grading the you know when it is whether it's mild moderate or severe that so yeah. so yeah. sir right. would occur only in severe pancreatitis sir sir can occur transiently also in mild interstitial pancreatitis right. usually right. you can you have that yeah yeah you yeah. may have leukocytosis right you may have tachypnea right but you may not have raised temperature right right that can occur okay. the force features of sir so to further my question sir dr chaya to you jama oncology see uh 
May, just few months back, 2022, this year, talked about the CRC, colorectal cancer screening. And they said, if you screen patients, it will reduce by at least, uh, you know, one third the risk would reduce. And what about patients who are more than 75 years? See, the chance of bleeding and uh, probably the perforation of the colon could occur, but the benefits outweigh the risks. What do you say, sir? You want me to answer somebody? I you, want to. Okay. Colorectal cancer. So <laughs> remember, sir, when you risk, think about colorectal cancer screening, you must understand the epidemiology of colorectal cancer. Now, colorectal cancer prevalence in India, in comparison to the West, right, is much, much less. True. First, they have, since colorectal cancer prevalence is high in the West, they recommend five yearly colonoscopy in every person above 50. Right. This is a recommendation. If you have a history of a family history of colon cancer or head and neck cancer, you have a higher risk and then internal comes down to one year screening. Right. Here in India, it is less, but gradually the frequency is increasing. So, Asian Pacific region of colorectal association has recommended after 50, every five year screening of 50 years people, right? Five years screening. But colonoscopy is safe, sir. Colonoscopy is not associated with what for is unless you are you are a, you are a, uh, a trainer, training and you are initially take doing it without supervision. That's or you have advanced malignancy. Yes. Or you have some other pathology right. which you don't know. Absolutely. Let me tell you. Yeah. We all think we don't have enough colorectal cancer in India. It's a huge amount. There you are. We should all as doctors first talk of getting there, of screening colonoscopies done. I've got mine done. I wonder I'll have a show of hands as to who's got their screening colonoscopy done. Nobody. Two. Well, I had a two centimeter part. And if I had left it behind, I would have had cancer a few years back. I think we should all first start with us. If we don't start with us, what advice are we going to give to our patients? Very good. We need to have screening. Have we aren't screening enough. If we are all above 50, very few young people. So, as Dr. Puri said, friends, all of us must screen for colorectal cancer. Sir, after the age of what? 50, 50. 50, not 60. 50, 50, 50, sir. Okay, but if you have a family history, probably. In US guidelines, they have cut down the age. They have cut right. it to 45 now. Right, right. In right. India, we keep it at 50, sir. But if you have a history of family history, or if you have a previous history of polyp, which is adenomatous polyp, if you have a family history of head and neck cancer, you are more prone to develop right, colorectal cancer. There are certain risk factors, but above 50, your lifestyle has changed. You, you are no more leading that classical, traditional Indian life. Ask your last question. Okay, uh, just, Sir. just two questions, uh, Dr. Surakshan. You talked about uh, endoscopy. So, uh, would you like to use uh, prokinetics like fetoclopramide uh, uh, or uh, erythromycin uh, before you do a gastric visualization to the endoscopy? And what is the drug you prefer? Uh, is it erythromycin or is it metoclopramide? Uh, routinely, we don't use uh, prokinetic. Rather than a prokinetic, in order to see the mucus, usually the secretions are much more. So we use NSI system. So that actually clears of the mucus and a simple NSI system with ask the patient to drink around 50 to 100 ml of water that will clear of the esophageal secretion. And sometimes there are a lot of bubbles in the uh, intestine and also the stomach. So for that, there is actually a a combination of semithicone and uh, anesthetocysteine available that we use. Right. So, Dr. Piyush, uh, last question to you. Uh, uh, what about uh, the wireless endoscopy? Although, you know, conventional endoscopy uh, is the gold standard to visualize uh, uh, proximal and distal 
part of the GI tract. What about the small intestines, uh, tumors, or you know, that? Uh, that? Uh, in, uh, uh, you know, so, sir, capsule uh, endoscopy. Capsule yeah. endoscopy. Yeah. Uh, there are specific limitations. There are specific limitations to what point we can reach in small uh, in small nose. So we have capsule endoscopy, which can help us in therapeutic scopes to reach there and intervene. Actually, Doctor Bhabha. Doctor Bhabha. Sir, one question from you. Sir, before yeah, we have. Sir, I have few comments. Yes. And, uh, I am a family physician. I have been practicing for 40 years. So we are the first doctor to come across such type of cases. I want to comment. You know, first thing is gold medal stone. What I tell my patients, he is half dead who marked When you see a stone, immediately remove the gold medal. Why? Because the gold medal is destroyed. That is causing the stone formation. And the kidney stone is not by kidney. The stone causes the kidney destruction. So that is my first comment to all my patients that if you see a gallbladder stone that is formed because of the gallbladder disease. It is not because of the stone which gallbladder is destroyed. So immediately remove it. That's my first thing. Second for constipation, what I tell my patient and I am really, you know, I feel the, it will immediately affect I ask my patient to not take any atta with choker. Correct? Choker means the cover of bra. It is bra. So if the patient is taking choker the atta, so he will be relieved of constitution. Third thing. We have told about GRP. May I, may I interrupt, sir? Uh, uh, are you saying the origin of it? No, sir. No, sir. No, 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 no okay. sir. Say so the practical experience. Okay. Okay. Try it. We, we try it. We try it. We can, if the patient is coming with constipation, ask him to remove the choker. Sir, next. Okay. next. Sir, third point, sir. He is telling his experience. I am telling my experience. He is not telling about anything. I am telling about GRP. 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 There are two factors, three factors, rather two I will tell you. One is the oil, what we are consuming today, what we are having right now. They are not properly edible oil. So I am 100% correct because I tell my patient who is having GRD not to take mustard oil, not to take soya bean oil. He can take peanut oil or JCD or butter. The patient improves with the same PTI. This is my practical experience. It is not practical, sir. You see, remember, many, many important scientific things has come from simple observations. Okay. You have a very astute observations. But to convince others, you need some evidence. Sir, I have respect to your... If you take some people, they come to me. I have a huge pressure that you know, Sir, I think we completely disrupt and agree with you. They take a thing Observation and, and is the key. The you know? It may be right, but you need to do evidence. Sir, second thing. People who take, you know, these uh, packets, you know, uh, chips and all that, and young people they take, and these chips are not pure masala, they are artificial flavors. So they are causing more of gastritis in young patients rather than anything else. This is my observation. Sir, you are very right. I would suggest you have a have a talk. So we last 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 comment here before we wind up. I know, sir. I should have asked many questions, but anyway, we are very sorry, sir. Yeah, he said endoscopic ultrasound guided gentleness to me. I think it is only for malignant lesions. For benign lesions, you should do definitive surgery. Second thing you said about. Colonoscopy. Uh, uh, so my experience is many patients. Of I have seen doctors treating clinic triage and provides. And on uh, next visit, third visit, fourth visit, they come to a surgeon. We simply do PRA examination and proctoscopy, and we found that there is a rectal growth. So my request to all physicians is at least once. Before you start treatment of file, the patient should be subjected to PR examination, not colonoscopy. At least 
One PM Why not single mark and above 50 corners copying mark. Above 50 as you rightly said. Or there are other warning symptoms. Last question. Then last question. Then what is the role of endoscopy? Spray treatment in GI upper GI. Endoscopy is spray treatment. So that's what it goes spray. Which is there. Salt which we are getting in India is not what is there which was initially. Efficacy has been recommended, but the results are not so good. Sankaracharya, sir, regarding the team deliberation, regarding the medical symptomatology, how do you differentiate between irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease? Well, that's a very important question. So, if you see, it's a long history. Ulcerative colitis and Crohn's are organic diseases. Irritable bowel syndrome is a dysfotility disorder. The first thing you will find, the duration of history, the long and irritable bowel syndrome. Second thing you will find, in irritable bowel syndrome, two types, constipatic type, diarrheal type. They will not have nocturnal diarrhea. Right? Because they are functional. They will sleep, they will not have nocturnal diarrhea. Third thing you will see, they will not have blood or mucus in this stool. Blood and mucus indicate that there is a definite pathology. Now, in Crohn's, ulcerative colitis is predominantly a large bowel disease. Invariably, patients will present with altered bowel and with mixed with blood and mucus. And since it is a large bowel disease, it is more frequent, small volume, and the rectum is 90% cases involved. Whenever you have rectal involvement, you will get perianal discomfort, which we call tenismus. So there are classical symptoms. Whereas in Crohn's disease, can involve small bowel, junction of small bowel and large bowel, musical junction, or large bowel, or combinations. Usually Crohn's disease will have pain at the very small bowel like cervical obstruction. And since large segments are involved, there will be lack of absorption, there will be diarrhea, pain and diarrhea. And if large bowel is involved, even you may have a bleed. But you have to confirm and rule out by a colonoscopy. And as Surakhit and Pio that Dr. Puri has described, there are specific investigations to look into small intestine and whole part of the large intestine to confirm. But clinically, you can easily differentiate by the parts. Dr. Puri, you have been talking about uh, CT enterogram. What is the perfect indication for doing CT enterogram? If you are thinking in terms of a mucosal disease, a biliary obstruction, don't ask for a routine CT. You get a, do a routine CT, you will miss the small bowel. You want to fill up the bowel well to visualize the mucosal details and look for obstructions. So, you know, whenever we ask for a CT of the abdominal, we have to see what disease are we asking for. If we are looking for diagnostic if we are looking for small bowel, there is a different way of looking for it. If we are looking for liver tumors, we have to do a different way of giving contrast. So, if we are looking for the small bowel, we have to give adequate contrast to visualize When you are doing cholangiography, you are doing MRCP also and EUS. Endoscopic ultrasound is slightly better to see it. How actually? Definitely better. So what you have to do, if you are thinking in terms of a bile duct stone, if the ultrasound picks up the stone, the story is over. You know the disease. There also we would like to make sure that we are not having a false form. You are going for an invasive test, so we need to be sure. What we are looking is to do an MR. If your mouth is picking up a stone, that's enough, we don't need to do more. Often small stones can be missed on your mouth. So endoscopic ultrasound is good. At the same city, once you have ultrasound which is positive, take the patient for an endoscopic ultrasound. Don't spend money doing another MR first. You've done an ultrasound, ultrasound is not picking up a stone. Instead of doing MR, do endoscopic ultrasound. If the stone is there, same sitting you do a yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.